In this video, we'll be discussing the anatomy and physiology of the thoracic diaphragm, normally just called the diaphragm, and most of us already know that it's the major muscle of inhalation or inspiration. It's shown down here in this image in green, and we'll be talking about its origin, insertion, action, innervation, blood supply, and other relevant clinical features. So first of all, the diaphragm itself is divided into two halves a right half and a left half, and each half of it is called a hemidiaphragm. So over here on the patient's left, this would be the left hemidiaphragm. Over here on the patient's right, this would be the right hemidiaphragm. And each hemidiaphragm is actually innervated by its own phrenic nerve. We'll be talking about that more when we get to the innervation. There would be a left phrenic nerve over here and a right phrenic nerve over here. Then if we look at each hemidiaphragm, there are three individual parts, a sternal part, a costal part, and a lumbar part. So the sternal part actually has its origin at the posterior aspect of the xiphoid process. What you're seeing right here is a cross section of the diaphragm. They've taken a body, cut off the superior part, and now you're looking down, looking inferiorly at the top surface of the diaphragm. Back here is the thoracic vertebrae, so this would be posterior. Here's the sternum making this anterior, so over here is right, over here is left. If we look at this nice red meaty tissue right here, this is actually the muscular part of the diaphragm. And so this muscular tissue over here would be the left hemidiaphragm, this would be the right hemidiaphragm. And in the center of each hemidiaphragm, there's this white aponeurotic tissue. This is actually a component of the central tendon of the diaphragm. We haven't gotten there yet, but we will in just a couple of minutes. And then you see this serous tissue right here that's actually attached to the muscular part of the diaphragm. And this is the diaphragmatic part of the parietal pleura. So this tissue right here is actually how the diaphragm attaches on the lungs. And when it contracts, it pulls the parietal pleura, allowing the lungs to expand so that you can actually inhale and get air into your lungs. Now back down here to the sternum. This is anterior, of course. And we know that the most inferior part of the sternum is the xiphoid process. So the component of the diaphragm who actually attaches on the xiphoid process, well, that's going to be the sternal part of the diaphragm. Specifically, it attaches on the posterior aspect of the xiphoid process. We also have a costal part of each hemidiaphragm, and the costal part is going to originate from the lower costal cartilages and ribs 7 through 12, specifically the inferior surfaces of those costal cartilages and ribs 7 through 12. Then we also have a lumbar part of each hemidiaphragm. Now this originates from multiple structures. Number one, the medial and lateral arcuate ligaments, the bodies of vertebrae L1 through L3 and their associated intervertebral discs, and also the anterior longitudinal ligament, which is associated with the vertebral body. This is arguably the best image on the internet that depicts the relationship of the diaphragm to some of these muscles of the lower abdominal and pelvic cavities. So you can obviously see the diaphragm up here. Here's the muscular parts of it. You can see this white aponeurotic tissue here. This would be the central tendon. Really the common part of the central tendon is up here. It's been cut. And then you can see it bifurcates into a component that goes toward the right hemidiaphragm and another component that goes towards the left hemidiaphragm. You can also see here the esophageal hiatus, where the esophagus emerges inferiorly into the abdominal cavity. And the same thing here for the aorta as it moves into the abdominal cavity. So this would be the aortic hiatus. Now, this is a frontal section, so the entire anterior half has been removed. So we don't have a sternum, nor a xiphoid process, so we can't see the sternal part of the diaphragm. We can, however, see a component of each costal part of each hemidiaphragm. Here's one of them. Here's the left costal part of the hemidiaphragm. And we know that the costal parts originate from the inferior surfaces of ribs 7 through 12, and then also some of the lower costal cartilages. But the nice thing about this picture is we can really see the lumbar part 
of the diaphragm. So all this right here, this is all the lumbar part. So jumping down a little bit, it's not actually labeled here, but this small ligament right here, this is the medial arcuate ligament. On the right, this would be the left medial arcuate ligament. So then immediately lateral to that would actually be the right lateral arcuate ligament. Here's the left lateral arcuate ligament. And you can see here there is a piece of each hemidiaphragm that attaches on each of these arcuate ligaments. This part of it goes down to the medial arcuate ligament. This thicker part goes down to the lateral arcuate ligament, and this occurs on each side. You should also notice that inferior to the lateral arcuate ligament on each side, we actually have the quadratus lumborum muscle, which then goes and attaches on the iliac crest. We'll talk about the quadratus lumborum in another video. And then coming down from the medial arcuate ligament, we have the psoas minor muscle. It actually turns out that a lot of people don't even have this muscle, so sometimes it's omitted. And then directly posterior to the psoas minor, we have the much larger psoas major. And that, of course, goes down inferiorly, and its tendon fuses with that of the iliacus to form this conjoined tendon, which goes down to the lesser trochanter of the femur. You can also see that each hemidiaphragm also has a cruce. This right here is the left cruce, and it goes down all the way to the vertebral body of L3. Over here is the right cruce, and you can see it goes down about to the body of L2, and probably some to the intervertebral disc between L2 and L3. And again, it was each cruce that originated from the bodies of vertebrae L1 through L3 and their associated intervertebral discs. And we couldn't see it in the image, but remember that there's also an origin off of the anterior longitudinal ligament of the spine. Now we keep mentioning the central tendon of the diaphragm. It turns out this is the insertion of each hemidiaphragm and the diaphragm as a whole. So in this picture, you have the stomach here covering up the left hemidiaphragm, but again, that left hemidiaphragm would ultimately insert on the central tendon. The right hemidiaphragm here would also insert on the central tendon. And the central tendon itself actually attaches and fuses with the diaphragmatic part of the parietal pleura. So bottom line, when the diaphragm contracts, we know that the insertion is always pulled toward the origin. So the insertion, the central tendon, is pulled down toward the origin. So actually, when the diaphragm contracts, this surface right here is pulled down inferiorly. Well, the central tendon is attached to the diaphragmatic part of the parietal pleura, which is in turn attached to each lung. And so when the diaphragm contracts and the insertion is pulled down towards the origin, that's how the lungs, the bottom surfaces, are pulled downward and the lungs overall expand. And that allows air to come into the lungs, bringing up its action the primary muscle of inspiration. And note that it's also assisted in part by the external intercostal muscles. The external intercostals aid with inspiration. Those are the two main muscles, but the diaphragm is by far more important. Also note that there are other accessory muscles of inspiration for very forceful inhalations that you might have during an athletic competition or going to the gym, but during quiet inhalation, it should only be the thoracic diaphragm and just a little bit of the external intercostals. As we mentioned before, each hemidiaphragm is innervated by a phrenic nerve. There's a left and right, and each one has nerve roots from C3 down to C5. So if somebody has a transection at the C2 level of the spinal cord, they will be unable to breathe by themselves because if you transect the C2 level, then C3 and anything below that will be non-functional, assuming it's a complete spinal cord injury. That person would likely die, and the only way to keep them alive is to use complete mechanical ventilation. Okay? Remember, there's a left phrenic nerve and a right phrenic nerve. And also know that the peripheries of the diaphragm also get some motor innervation from the intercostal nerves at levels 6 through 11. And blood supply to the diaphragm is via the subcostal and the lowest five intercostal arteries, also the inferior phrenic arteries and the superior phrenic arteries.
Now, there's other clinical relevance of the diaphragm. So let's think about this. With the lungs, there are three major zones of respiration. There's an upper or superior zone, that's up here. There's a middle zone or intermediate zone, probably about here. And then there's a lower or inferior zone down here. And of course, the lower zone is closest to the diaphragm. The superior zone is closest to where the accessory muscles are, like the scalenes shown right here. Now, people who are chronically stressed have a tendency to take shallow, rapid breaths. This shallow, rapid breathing is always going to rely partly on the diaphragm. I mean, you can't inhale without using the diaphragm to some extent. However, you can lower the percent contribution by the diaphragm and increase the percent contribution by these accessory muscles up here. And when you do that, you're gonna rely more on these upper and middle zones for inhalation and a lot less on the lower zones for inhalation. Why is this a problem? Because this pattern of breathing produces less activation of the parasympathetic nervous system. Why is this important? Because true diaphragmatic work, belly breathing, it's done deeply, it's done slowly, and there's a substantial amount of evidence that shows that it activates the parasympathetic nervous system. If you have somebody who's chronically stressed, they're taking rapid, shallow breaths, right? They are not effectively using their diaphragm. And so we need to teach them how to use their diaphragm appropriately. Why do they need to do that? Well, number one, it allows full ventilation of all three zones of the lungs, which is good, better oxygenation to tissues. It minimizes the use of accessory muscles, right, up here. But it also is going to activate the parasympathetic nervous system a lot better. It's going to help them decrease their heart rate, decrease their blood pressure by using all three zones. It improves oxygenation of the body. And again, it's used to manage stress and anxiety. Okay, so in a future video, I'm going to be showing you how to actually activate the diaphragm appropriately, how to breathe using the diaphragm, and what you'll probably see if you do this is your heart rate and blood pressure will decrease. Using this diaphragm appropriately, it seems kind of trivial, but there's a lot of people that don't do it correctly, and they can benefit from learning how to activate it appropriately. In a future video, probably the next one, I'll be showing you how to appropriately activate your diaphragm to perform diaphragmatic or belly breathing. And what you'll find if you do that is your heart rate and blood pressure will probably decrease. And so many patients out there that are stressed, anxious, always using their accessory muscles, they got tight upper traps, tight scalings, they could benefit so much from learning how to breathe appropriately. And that's what I'm gonna show you in probably the next video. So hopefully this video gave you a good overview and understanding of the anatomy and physiology of the diaphragm and why using it appropriately is so critical. Thank you for all your support. Be sure to check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.